And welcome back to another episode of the Choose 954 podcast, episode 86, with Oolite resident artist Matt Forehand, sitting here in the Hollywood Art and Culture Center in front of his uh, current exhibition, which we'll tell you a little bit more about in a little bit. If you didn't know about Choose 954, myself, Evan Snow, and my business partner, Mr. Andrew Martineau, started an initiative to cultivate culture and community in Broward County to keep people to know what the great things that are going on in an effort to make this a better place to live and not just a better place to vacation as arts advocates, community builders, and creative entrepreneurs. So the point of the podcast is to connect you, the viewer, with amazing people like this young man that are doing important things in the community. And this is a great show and he's got a wealth of knowledge that we're very excited to share. So without much further ado, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself at a high level? Um, so my name is Matt Forehand. I am a painter, printmaker. Um, I graduated from the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago with a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Um, my focus was painting and printmaking. And I'm currently based here in Miami. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not originally from Miami. Um, I do have connections here, but this is where I'm based out of and um, pursuing my art practice. And considering potentially moving to Broward. And considering moving to Broward eventually. We'll see if we can swing that decision <laughs> a little bit. So how did you initially get started in the arts? What that journey look like? So um, just like any kid, you know, you kind of have that thing you gravitated towards. And um, mine was always, you know, this is probably a very cliche answer, but, you know, I doodled a lot um, as I got into the high school, I was doing like graffiti, and not necessarily on walls, but I had sketchbooks and, you know, friends wanted me to draw their shoes or their hat or something, something lame like that. And I was into skateboarding, so that kind of opened the avenues of doing like stencils and like on boards and translating into surfing. When I was a surfer, I would also paint my friend's boards and stuff, on my board. And so that's really where the art um, started for me. Aptitude for art started. Um, I guess I've always had like a, a good visual literacy, and so um, it kind of came naturally to me. But I never thought I was going to make a career out of it. I really didn't. Just, I, I'm not sure a lot of artists say that too. It's, it's not like, oh, I'm going to pursue a, a career in the arts. It was something that just very organic kind of came out of people who mentored me. So. And then how did that lead to the um, Art Institute? So, I served in the military. Thank you for your uh, service. Thank you. Uh, I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps. Uh, say once a Marine, always a Marine. So, I'm still a Marine. Um, but I went to Marines, not really, you know, I'm a young kid. I had just graduated high school. I struggled to graduate high school. In fact, I graduated like a year late because I dropped out. And then realize that you know not having a high school degree is really hard. Same here, by the way. Really? Yeah. 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 So um, I went back. I went to my school. Eventually graduated. And I was like, okay, now I'm gonna go to college. And I went to a community college in um, Pensacola, Florida, where I was. That's home for me. It's Pensacola, Florida, it's Panhandle. And uh, I did night night school. Graduated. Got my diploma. Went to college. And then realized that you know college just wasn't. In, in the books for me at the moment. So I didn't really know what to, to do. I come from a military family. They're all Air Force. Um, my mom, my dad, my oh, wow. sister, my brother-in-law, my uncles. Um, so I chose a different path and I said, you know, we'll do the Marine Corps. And I'm gonna see if I can make a career at this or if anything, I can pay for college. Right. Cause Coming from an enlisted family, they didn't have money for school necessarily. We didn't have college funds or anything like that. So I had to figure out a way to pay if I wanted to go. Um, so I did my four years. New year one, I, I didn't want to make a career out of being in the Marine Corps. Um, I loved the Marine Corps. It was a good time in my life, but it wasn't it. You know, I didn't really have that fulfillment. I liked education, though, because uh, in the Marine Corps, you got to teach. And so I knew education was something I wanted to pursue. So I got out, um, and I went to Pensacola State College, enrolled there, uh, was taking education classes or a degree to 
become an educator. I was thinking maybe art history, or not art history, history. Mm. Um, and then I took an art history class, I took a painting and a drawing class. And in my drawing class, the professor was saying, I see something here. Take my painting class. So I took her painting class. Her name's Paula Work. Um, she's still a professor at Mexico State College. And uh, amazing painter. And she kind of mentored me during that period. Um, she's, yeah, she really guided me. And she went to SAIC, the School Day Institute of Chicago. Um, so I was like, well, I like Chicago. I think Chicago would be like a cool place to live. I had never been there, but I. Oh, really? In my mind, I'm thinking of like all the growing up in late 80s, early 90s, like all the movies like seem to you know, home alone to Chicago. Right. Like, you see Chicago everywhere. So I was like, oh, this would be a cool place. The, bull, the Bulls are there. I like sports. So I ended up uh, putting an application in, got accepted into SAIC, was ecstatic. And I had other applications into other schools like KCAI in Kansas. Um, I was looking at some schools in Florida, uh, but then I was like, uh, in Pratt in New York, but then I, you know, as soon as I heard back from my CAC, I think that was where I was, was going to go. So, Jeez. So yeah, that was kind of like my journey into it. And then I think once you take that financial leap of faith, because, um, you know, art school is not cheap, I knew that it was going to, I was going to have a, a, um, art career in some some capacity, whether it's education or being an artist myself. So And yeah, moving to another city, you know, yeah. is is a leap of faith and not exactly. free or inexpensive either, especially Chicago. Exactly, yeah. I mean cities are pretty expensive. You know, I supported myself through art school by dog walking. I mean sure. you know, the military paid for some of that. The GI Bill. Nice. But it only lasted so long because art school you know, it's pretty expensive, so I ended up even having to take a loan out for my last couple semesters, which, you know, it's it's not cheap. Sure. So. Well, so, uh, prestigious, prestigious, one of the most prestigious art schools. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like? What did you get from that experience, and how did that kind of help you transition from, you know, inspiring or, you know, artist to... Yeah, so, going into the school, you know, I think most uh, young artists, when they go to art school, they have this like image in their head that art school is going to be like this is the top of the top. Like, these these artists here are going to be like blowing you away. You're going to be like you think you're good now. When you get there, it's going to be you're going to be the bottom of the rung. <laughs> and I got there and I had this high expectation, but it's not really like that. There's all different levels at art school, um, and I quickly found out that you, I need to tie myself into the the circles, or like you know, I need to hang out with the artists that have kind of a similar thought towards their practice as I do. So I was I was a lot more serious about my work than most. I was also older too. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in classes with 17, 18, 19 year old uh, right out of high school, and I'm uh, 20. I probably was like. 24 mm -hmm. and so you know I had a little bit more of a maturity when it came to my work I, but I, I was also not very conceptual at all my work was I went I was there to learn how to be a painter and, and I found printmaking through that um, but again I tied myself into um, inner circles that, of artists who think a lot like me and in fact, I was very um, fortunate to have roommates that were kind of along those same paths. So I roomed, roomed with a, an artist who's actually, I don't know where he's at now, I've kind of fallen out of contact, but uh, Carlos Gamet de, Fran de Francisco, he's an artist here in Florida, he's, um, he's an amazing painter, and he was a lot more serious, he was really focused on making a his art into a business. Again, I'm not really focused on that. I'm focused on just becoming an artist, sure. just becoming a painter or a printmaker. Um, one of my best friends that we ended up moving out uh, into the uh, city of Chicago because you're in the dorms and you want to 
you know, it's too expensive, so you gotta move somewhere else. So we ended up moving to Pilsen, which is the huh. southern part of it. I know Pilsen, the loop. So it's like, I was barely out of the loop, but it's like, it's the south side. And I remember just us young kids, never lived in Chicago before, we're kind of like, you're at a big, we're getting this house, we're renting it, you know, me, my friend Ryan Meese, and my friend Oscar. And, um, well, anyways, they, they're they also very focused on their, their practice, and especially Ryan Meese Vasquez, that was my best friend out of the, um, at SAC. And he's an amazing painter. Uh, you, if you recognize the name, he was featured in Art Basel. He was in the big fair, and they posted his wow. painting. So he's doing really good. And he's, although we're peers, he's been mentoring me a lot through this, you know, wow. early stages of my own art practice. Wow. So, but it was good having the that type of person around me that could dro we drove each other, you know. And it's also. It's a competitiveness in a way where you know um, we see how we how each other are working. Like, oh, he's painting this. I want to like also paint something similar. And like, and that and that competitiveness is good in some aspects because it can drive you, you know, to to kind of do better in your work and not get kind of complacent. Like, was that was that that competitiveness? Was that through the coursework and through? The program, or was that separate on the side? I think it was through the program, but it was also on the side too. You know, um, there was a lot of times where, um, and it's it's not. I, I feel like competitiveness sounds kind of like bad sometimes, like uh, together, like. But we're driving each other. Yeah, like, like, in a positive hey, way. Yeah, in a positive way, and it was it was really good. And till this day, you know, I, um, I mean, Riley's will have a FaceTime. We usually try FaceTime like once a month, once or twice a month, and he'll be like, hey, are you finishing these things? Because like, I, I have a tendency to not finish stuff. I, I'm like ADD when I do my work. Um, so I'll, I'll like work on some stuff, and and then I'll move on. And even in this gallery, I know that there's parts that are unfinished. And maybe it can go unseen by most viewers, but I know myself that there's a little opportunities that were left you know, whether it worked out or not, I don't know, but, you know, sometimes, um, you know, it's just, it's hard to finish something for me. Uh, and that's, again, okay, that's like... I know we, uh, well, we'll show them later, I had actually asked you at the opening if this piece was dry, because it looked like it was yeah. still wet. Yeah, no, it was, uh, <laughs> that piece in particular was um, wet when I dropped it off. I'm sure it's dry to a, a point, but it's not, like, Really. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, you know, there's actually, um, you know, so I look up to a lot of artists, and there's a quote by Peter Doig that says, you know, a, a work of art is not finished until it's leaving the, the studio. And <laughs> a lot of these, you know, I have to leave, this piece has to leave the studio within an hour, and I'm like still working on it. <laughs> and it's oil. It's oil, yeah. So that's even more intense, I guess. But, um, I usually try not to leave it up to that short of time period, but maybe a day, maybe a couple. It's a great piece for the record. We'll show you the little bit he wanted to have in the exhibit, so we're glad that you were able to make that work. And um, so you you had you obviously had a, a good experience. You were able to at, at Art Institute yeah. able to learn a lot and take a bunch of things away. There there was one thing that you mentioned when we were speaking before that you were able to take away that you found on your orientation? Oh yeah, so I met my wife in orientation. Um, and it's, you know, it's a funny thing. I, so when I got to Chicago, I was actually dating someone at the time. And so um, my friend group, which, you know, when you, when you get to these places, it's like, okay, who am I gonna hang out with? And the first people I hang out with is Carlos, um, the artist I just mentioned. Um, and then you meet other people. So they kind of form like a little group. It just so happened that all the people that I hung out with were like the Latin students. So a lot of them from Miami, my wife's from Colombia, Carlos is from Cuba. We have artists from uh, Puerto Rico. And we just kind of formed a little group and we'd go out, you know, on the weekends and typical college kids, you know, go drink or go to a restaurant or something. And, uh, so I hung out with uh, Catalina, my wife, and you know, 
inevitably the relationship that I was in, uh, in ended and, you know, I, she was my friend and kind of was very organic at that point. Everything used, happens for a reason. I use the word organic a lot because it just comes out. No, good. <laughs> organic is good. Nothing wrong with organic. Uh, so, good experience. Um, any other takeaways or any other things worth mentioning from that Chicago experience that helped set you on your, your path and uh, options back on it? Yeah, so I think the interaction with professional artists. So the professors that are teaching at SASC are usually have had like a practice and are pretty established themselves as artists. Um, they've you know gone through the same things that you are getting ready to go through. And from what I found out, you know, a lot of people that go to art school don't necessarily end up doing art. So these are the ones that pursued a practice had success at it, and now are trying to give back, which is, you know, teaching is a very important part of an artist's own practice. I mean, it, it's, it's good to talk about your ideas and to, um, even when you're teaching very basic ideas, bringing those into your, your works of art um, or your pieces. So um, I think the interaction with professional artists, um, I had a professor, Cory Newkirk, um, Dan Gustin, Susanna Coffey, these are professors that, to this day, it could have been like a sentence, but those have like sat with me, and I think about it when I'm pursuing, or when I'm painting a painting or doing a print. Um, you know, Corey, I remember one time he said, this is just off the top of my head, uh, don't give away all your secrets. And it's just a very little tiny nugget, oh, but, you know, I, I when I'm doing studio visits or interviews like this, you know, sometimes I think about those things and, you know, it sits with me and I'm like, yeah, you're right, you know, there's secrets that you do as an artist that leaves people wanting to figure out how you did something or why you did something or why you didn't do something. So I think those are important little, that's just one example, but there's plenty of more examples. Got a great counter to that quote, and that comes because we don't want to give away some of our, you know, IP as well. Yeah. You can tell them the why, but not the how. Yeah, the why. That's a good one, so I'll keep that one too. Um, Chicago, one of my favorite cities. Yeah. Just such a, just so much culture. I mean, there's, you know, Picasso pieces, and, in, and uh, we were talking um, about not just the Art Institute, but yeah. the Culture Center mm -hmm. has that amazing long Keith Haring mural. Yeah. Uh, even one thing that comes to mind, I love house music. They have like the original Frankie Knuckles DJ set. They have like, and he was like the godfather of house music that started yeah. back in Chicago back in the day. So much culture. And um, I'm really glad that you got to take that experience and be amongst not only peers, contemporaries, but the professors and other intellectuals. Because I'm sure that did kind of raise the bar for you. Um, I mentioned competitiveness, and it, it, it is in a positive way. Yeah. And when you're amongst these these thought leaders, when you're amongst you know people that you admire and respect and learn from, it does kind of help set you on a path. Not that you couldn't have had that if you went to exactly. FAU or you know Broward College or something like that. But even in Chicago, like uh, I went to the Soho House one time, and um, one of the members was telling me that their book club. Like a Pulitzer Prize winner would just like drop into the book club. Yeah. Like, this, of course, that's going to help you be a better writer or a better reader. Yeah. Um, so you took this experience. You made some great connections. Obviously, we're going to send the yeah. podcast to Carlos. Yeah. Uh, so where did things kind of take you after Chicago? So after Chicago, after graduation, um, I actually stayed. I stayed for a okay. year after graduation because Catalina at the time um, she was still had a year left okay. at the uh, Arts Institute. And so I was walking dogs. Um, I was trying to work every once in a while, but you know, like the financial part of it, oh, it sometimes takes over your life and you're like, man, I just gotta, I gotta work because I gotta make money. I'm like a broke college student now, mm -hmm. ex-college student. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was waiting for her to graduate and I was looking for opportunities. We didn't really know where we wanted to move. Um, and then during that period, I also proposed to her, so we got engaged. Um, and so we were like, where are we going to move? Where are we going to move? And LA was like the number one. Like, that 
I was like, okay, we'll move to LA. They have a great art scene. It's a big metropolitan city. Um, I have a friend, my, my best friend, I consider my brother from Pensacola, lives there with his wife. And I was like, this is, just makes sense. Um, but then as we started talking about it, we were like, well, maybe we'll consider just staying in Chicago. But then the weather's like a lot, it's, it's rough, you know, especially if you're from Florida and Ooh. from Bogota, like she is. Um, it's, it's hard. So then that kind of got nixed. And then I was like, well, my family, my mother's family came from Colombia. Most of them live here in Miami. So they immigrated to the United States and stayed in South Florida. And I was like, well, Miami could be a good spot. I know like it's a big city. They probably have a decent art scene. I know about Basel, and that was about it. And so we were like, okay, South Florida, Miami, good weather. And, you know, we have family there, so it's kind of a... And it's also close to Colombia, so we could, mm -hmm. it's like, I think it's a three-hour flight to mm -hmm. Bogota. And so we're like, I think it makes sense. So we chose Miami. Um, what year was this? This was 20... It must have been 2018. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Um, and so she applied for a bunch of jobs, and one of the jobs she applied for was like an English teacher. She didn't know that you had to have an English de degree, but like teaching English, like mm -hmm. language English, not like a, it wasn't like a, like teaching English as in like writing, reading, writing. Sure. Um, and then they did the interview and I was like, oh, no, this is for an English class, not like teaching English mm -hmm. to Spanish speakers. And she's like, oh, okay. And then he's like, well, do you, we are an art school. Do you have um, any, can you teach art classes? She's like, no, but my fiance teaches. He just got his BFA um, and he can teach. So I interviewed, the day I was leaving Chicago, I got the job at a charter school here. Well, oh, nice. in, in Miami, Miami Arts Charter School. And uh, I pretty much, it was like, I had planned to come to Miami spend a month looking for jobs and then see what happens. But, you know, I got the, um, I got the job and it was just like hitting the ground running. So I got to Miami, school started in a week or so. Well, so I had really just got immersed in the teaching world. And I was teaching sixth grade elements of art. I was teaching um, like eighth grade, for what that class was like, two-dimensional studio. I don't know, they had like, these big long labels, but they're kind of open-ended. And then I taught a drawing class for ninth graders, and then juniors and seniors are taught printmaking. So that had a big, like, you know, a big, uh, class load. Class load, yeah, thank you. Um, I had a big class load, and it was, it was a lot of work. I never worked that hard in my life. Like, and I was coming from, Kendall, like near Cutler, is it Cutler? Cutler Bay. Cutler Bay. Like, South far end of Ken Kendall. I had to go all the way to Winwood. I didn't have a car. I was taking the bus, the train. I was waking up at like four in the morning to get there by seven. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was a lot. And then you get home at like seven o'clock. And so it was, a, it was a lot of work. And sometimes I sit back and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that. But, um, but anyways, and she comes, um, and she's also looking for a work, or a job, and uh, she ended up getting a job at a gallery in um, the Contemporary that's still open. They're in Little River, um, Lauren and Jumani and Nandi. They're uh, great people to know here in the art world. A uh, close friend of ours that came to our wedding in Bogota. Hmm. So, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, yeah, from there I taught for four years. And, now I've recently stepped away, and this is where I'm pursuing my practice. Full time work. Yeah, full time work. Yeah. Amazing, and I appreciate you sharing that transparently. You know, it's it's not easy for anybody, yeah. even and you know, and I'll start, You know, the money thing is rea is the reality of life. Absolutely. Some people are fortunate to come from certain situations where they could just go to art school and focus on art and not have to worry about buying supplies and yeah. studio space and the financial components of life, but. In all reality, that is factors that, you know, not everybody considers. So when we talk about supporting the arts and why, you know, patronizing the arts and artists are important so that artists can continue pursuing their craft, their passion,
their creative outlet or their profession, whatever it may be for them. And unfortunately, as you kind of alluded to, there's probably so many talented artists yeah. that went to art school that unfortunately weren't able to pursue it. Absolutely. Um, that was one of the conversations that we had when I was in art school. You know, the, the really good professor would put it point blank that you know most of you are going to graduate art school and try to make it as an artist, and the financial part is going to interfere, and you're going to start working, and your your practice is going to get pushed aside, which happened to me. You know, teaching and trying to have a practice. It was really hard, especially teaching the capacity. Oh, oh so you're, and you're, you're waking up at 4, yeah. you get to school by 7, you get home at 7, and yeah. you basically have to turn around and go home and go to sleep. You don't really have time exactly. to work on your practice. And you're you're um, commuting like two hours a day, and you're trying to like come up with lesson plans and do grading, and then have like these one-on-one -on -one conversations with your students and help them with their work. It was really hard, and I would find times, like, you know, it's not good to say, but like, when they were working on their stuff, I would try to do something here and there. Okay. So, uh, constantly looking at the door, hoping that, that admin didn't come in and like catch me working on some kind of piece. But um, but that actually helped them too. They would see the work that and be like, oh, Mr. Forehead, wow, like how do you do that? And like get that question, um, you know, going in their head, and they're like, okay, I want to figure out how to, I can do my work like this. And so that that was really good. Um, but inevitably, I knew that this teaching thing was, and plus I had to also get certifications, which is another financial, not just financial, but time. You had to get, you had to take classes at Miami Dade, which was like out in Kendall, and like, how do I get there? Because I have to Uber, so that's another financial undertaking. So there's a lot of obstacles, but I would say I never lost my focus that I wanted to pursue um, my art career and one thing I would tell young artists is um, always look for opportunities even if you don't think that's going to lead towards anything. So as I was teaching I was offered at Ulite Arts I was offered the opportunity to teach uh, Saturday classes. Now Saturdays are now precious to me because those are my days off. Yeah. And at this time my wife is also moved from working at Anomaly to now working at Ulite. So she kind of was like, hey, oh. I'm looking for instructors, and I put your name out there for it. And I was like, okay. So I would teach you Saturday classes, and through that, I, you know, just by, I guess, networking, um, I found someone that helped me get a space, which was pretty convenient. It was, it was on Lincoln Road at the Lincoln Center. It was called Peekaboo Studios. They're, Unfortunately, they're closing now, but um, there was like a, they had the space open for two years, and there's these converted office spaces that they made into studios. Super cheap, too, compared to everything else. It's like 350 bucks a month, I think I was paying, plus taxes or something like that. So I uh, got a studio space, and, and that's when I was like, well, I have a space, I'm, I'm investing my money into the space and my time and buying supplies, so. I'm not doing this as a hobby. This is something I want to pursue. And through that connection, I'll give you kind of like, you know, this, there's a long form response to this, but I'll give you like the cliff notes. Um, I got different opportunities through the light. And I eventually did like a commission for them for uh, the board members, doing a print for the board members. Wow. And I think showing my abilities and showing my talents and taking these opportunities that came my way. Um, and that really helped me to move into the position as the printmaking resident at Ulite Arts. Well, for those that are not familiar, and, and I don't know if you know this, some of them might be familiar because Laura Marsh was the curator before Megan. Yeah. Um, but for those that are not familiar with Ulite Arts, could you just tell, tell them? So, so Ulite Arts is an arts uh, nonprofit, and they primarily give uh, grant money and studio spaces to Miami Dade artists, um, and they do a lot for the community in Miami Dade. Um, film as well. Film, and even the even uh, yeah, the new thing. And like I think film is fairly new, mm -hmm. but that's really kind of blowing up that that whole side of it. Like, and you mentioned Lincoln Road. 
and for those that are not familiar with Blue Light, it used to, or, well, Dennis Scholl previously had the South Florida Art Art and Culture Center. Yeah, that, so they changed it from South Florida Art Center to Blue Light Arts. And that served on like a, served a great purpose on the yeah. road for a long time. Exactly, and so they um, they owned a big portion of it. You know, they sold off that, so now they have a big endowment, and they use that money to really give back to Miami artists who for a long time have been kind of overlooked. Um, you know, New York is like where all the artists usually go. It's like a hub. Sure. LA is also a sure. hub. And Miami artists would have, unfortunately would have to leave Miami and go to these these cities. Even Chicago is somewhat of a uh, art hub. Sure, um, of course. And they want to kind of make Miami more of a, a footprint in the art world, like leave, like, uh, I mean, we have Art Basel, but even Basel, only until recently had Miami galleries represented in sure. the main fair. And so, um, so all I have to say is, yeah, who likes a great organization, Dennis Schultz doing a great job there, and, um, and I think I'm so blessed to be able to have the opportunity to be a resident there, um, I understand the position is it's hard to get and uh, coveted. And I'm coveted, and I uh, I really appreciate my time there, and, and I've grown a lot from the artists who are in that space. You know, they through conversations and you know impromptu studio visits. Like my work has really kind of excelled, I guess. And it, it's um, phenomenal. I mean, obviously. It's not the top, it's one of the top arts organizations now in Miami. Yes. Um, and it also has lent itself to this exhibition here in the Hollywood Art Culture Center in partnership yeah. with Blue Light that we'll talk about. But um, you're, and you're right, I mean, you just kind of summarize it, but like the studio visits, and I've heard stories yeah. of mega collectors and curators and gallery directors coming, you know, to see the, the residents. Um, the opportunities, I know there's a field trip. You know, field trips and trips and you know so many other opportunities and residencies and it's a it really is a, a blessing and we're really grateful that the initial you know took Absolutely. that money from the I think it was fifty seven million dollars they sold the building yeah. for and also I understand they're building a new permanent home. So they're building a new facility that's gonna be more of state of the art. Um, but it also and, and there's there's controversy with it just like anything. Because we're moving from dun, dun, dun. yeah exactly, and we, tr trust me, we sometimes since we are the, the people that are there all the time, we're the ones that take a lot on a lot of these like complaints. Go from like I can't believe they're moving this and that. Does it have to do with the G word? What's the G word? Gentrification. No, well maybe, but they also have to do a lot with um, the fact that ours. Uh, the Art Center in South Florida was such a like staple yeah. in that area and people have been coming there for years. And so again, like we don't it's not only like professional artists that we support, it's also the community that you know, people that wanna take classes and they wanna come in and use a print shop. And so they're upset that, you know, it's leaving the beach. But um, the counter to that is that this opens up opportunities for people who live on the mainland that can't make it to the beach. Correct. The beach is not always the easiest point of access for most people. It's, it's, it's hard to get to. I know because I commute it every day and I sit in that traffic on MacArthur Causeway and watch people fly by me on the shoulder. And then the parking <laughs> and the, yeah. all, the, all the things considered. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's one of those things that I think it's, it's going to really help out our arts community in Miami, in Miami Day. And, uh, and give opportunities to people that may not have that opportunity. And in all reality, I don't think it's moving to El Paso. It's moving to Little River. Little River. Yeah. I don't think moving to Little River is not causing more gentrification of anything. It's yeah. creating opportunities. But unfortunately, some people don't know how to look at the bigger picture, read between the lines, so they just put labels on things. But it is serving a great purpose. I know they make a lot of funds and resources available. You are in a unique position with Blue Light as a resident printmaker? Yeah, so as a print, uh, so my residency is a little different than the typical residency. Typical residency, they get a free studio space. Obviously, you get access to all the things that Blue Light has, classes, the print shop, 
but um, mine is different in the sense it's also kind of a job. So I teach printmaking classes, and then I also um, I also open up com the community print shop. So that means if you have authorization through either taking a class or you know you come and do an orientation with me, and it, it seems to me that you know what you're doing then you can come and use the space during open studio hours. So we offer open studio hours, which I encourage any printmakers or anybody who's, even if you're not a printmaker, come in um, and talk to me and if you have some ideas. We do screen printing, we do block printing, we do um, etching, but only on plexiglass, we don't have acid baths or... Um, not yet. Yeah, not yet, maybe eventually. And then we're, we do, I have introduced lithography to oh. the, and then, you know, myself, like, I love exploring new things, so I use the open studio hours to kind of explore different printmaking methods, and as soon as I learn something, I try to introduce it as a class, or uh, even if somebody comes in and they're like, hey, I have this idea, I just don't want to accomplish it, and I'm like, well, I just was digging through this old book, this old book I had, and I found this that made you know, suit your, your idea. Nice. Whatever that may be. So, um, so yeah, this is, there's a responsibility with that, you know, we're not just giving back, but um, trying to connect our print shop with other print shops in Miami. Uh, there's a great print scene in Miami. Um, I know Ingrid from IS Projects. Right. She's, I mean, she's a badass. And she's SPF. SPF. Tom Virgin. Yep. Old school printmaker. He's like the, uh, I mean, Tom Virgin is a wealth of knowledge, so if I have any kind of questions, I usually go to him. But, um, but yeah, he's got Virgin Press, and, you know, amongst others. And even, and that's kind of trickled into, you know, Fort Lauderdale, up here in Broward County. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of great printmakers up here. And uh, so the responsibility, I feel, as a printmaking resident is to um, really just connect ULAC with these different, you know, print shops and these different printmakers and the art community, our printmaking community as a whole. So For those that don't know what printmaking is. So if you don't know what printmaking is, it's um, it's a very uh, big term that kind of gets it gets pegged into a certain category. Printmaking is a lot of different things. And uh, it's essentially it's making multiples of one image. Um, now there is printmaking such as monotype, where mono meaning one, you only get one and maybe a ghost print, but that still counts as printmaking. Um, but you have, I mean, anything from uh, lithography, block printing, etching, uh, screen printing, cyanotypes, um, I mean, the list goes on. So, I mean, I guess you can kind of think of photography as printmaking. Making it into multiple, mm -hmm. multiple times, but um, and we do actually have a big printer for photo. If you're a photographer and you want to print out some photos, we have a um, a resource for that. So um, it's just one of those terms that it covers a lot of different avenues. And for someone, if somebody came in like, "Well, I really like painting. Uh, what do you suggest that I I do printmaking wise?" I would suggest either exploring some kind of stencil making with uh, screen printing and you can paint and make the stencils or I would say do monotype or somebody came in and said I really like to draw like uh, charcoal or graphite based drawings and I would say lithography is perfect for that um, and so it's just really just you know taking what you know in these other forms and kind of making an image that you can have multiple so in addition. Amazing. And so with regards to your work and specifically, how has printmaking evolved your practice? So printmaking serves as like, so in painting, for example, painting is very reactive. When I'm painting, I'm seeing something and I'm reacting to it by mixing color and making a mark, which does also have in printmaking. But in printmaking, there's a lot of process that's involved, and it's very process heavy. So it forces you to sit back and think more, and kind of be less reactive. Be more of like, okay, how are these two things going to work together? 
um, and how does this fit within this process? Because like to make a litho plate, you have to there's like chemicals involved and like it's like cooking equipment. Yeah, equipment. It's just like the way I would uh, describe it is um, it's baking versus just like cooking a meal. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you're cooking a meal, you can like it's a great no. throw a little salt, a little pepper, a little oregano, and then you know maybe you don't want to add it, and then you do. But with baking, it's like it's got to be measured. If I'm making a bread, I got to use this amount, um, and so that's kind of how you would view printmaking versus painting. And so the way it serves in my practice is it allows me to kind of slow down a bit um, to really think about like what the image is or what the concept is that I am pursuing. And there's a lot of visual problems that you know, I, I try to solve in a painting and then later on I'm like, well I kind of could have probably done that a little different. In printmaking, you kind of think about those visual problems a little bit more. Hmm. And so it's a, it allows you to hone in. So for example, um, in this show here, I have screen prints that go correlate with the paintings that are involved in the, only one of them there's not a painting for, but I, I do use a figure right. in other paintings that are actually not in the show, but I, I have used a figure before. Um, so these prints are four color separation prints and um, it came, came about through a conversation I had with Mark Florida. He kind of suggested that he was like, you use these reference photos to make your paintings, but these reference photos in, in themselves are very amazing. Like, they're really cool. And like, I think somehow you can, should display this. And I was like, well, I didn't really think about it because I just have them printed off. Like these screen prints, like, they're now prints, like a fine art piece. They were just photocopies. And so, I, through thinking about it, I'm like, well, how would I turn that into like a, like not just a photocopy? I could print them off on a printer, like a photo printer, but that's still kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So then, going back through my time at when I was at SASC, I'm like I remember doing screen printing, and I remember learning CMYK, which is like a photo. It's the way they used to make posters back in the day. Mm -hmm. So it's like those little half tone dots. Like I don't know if you ever looked at old magazines, you look up close and you can see them. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's essentially what it is, and it was a way for me to process not just the, these images through a painting, but process these images. Why am I making these images, or why are these images important to me? Why am I doing this collaging? Why am I doing these certain things within these little 8x10 uh, print-offs? Um, and yeah, it's really kind of... If it's led to other works that I'm currently working on that are not a part of this body of work. Well, they are, but they're not like not on this exhibit. Not on this exhibit. Um, and so again, that's for making played a big role in that. Um, I mean, sitting there for four or five hours making a print over the same image, you can't help but think about those things. I like that baking versus cooking analogy. Yeah. That that really does frame it and. In the frame, if you're watching on the video, you can see, well, it's zoomed out, but there's a, a print there and a print here, and then this is an original. Yeah, the, so this is a painting, yeah. So my oil paintings and my um, prints, are kind of, they have this, this weird relationship with each other, because sometimes they fit and sometimes they don't. And I was trying to bridge this gap, like how can I make this seamless gap between my prints and my... Because I do a lot of block prints, it's black and white. It's not always color. Um, I was like, how do I make these two worlds kind of like fit together? And and maybe they do to some people. Maybe they like people don't see the problem that I see in my head. But uh, but that's where the screen printing came in. So it allowed me to make these images in a printmaking, uh, true to my printmaking self, and, but still have that kind of feel to it. So for those that are admiring this painting, and um, we'll take the camera in a minute and show them the rest, but um, can you just give us an overview of this exhibit, and then it's specifically at least at first the painting. It's like a process? Uh, more about the, well the process as well, but uh, can you frame this, what this exhibit is, okay. and then this painting, and then the process as well. 
Okay, so yeah, they, they kind of, I mean, they, they do tie in some aspects, but so this exhibit is an exploration into my Colombian heritage. Um, so I, my mom is from Colombia, she's from Cali, Colombia. She came here, uh, she came here as a little girl, um, and they lived for about, I think my parents was six years in Michigan, when my grandfather went to, he did his residency at the University of Michigan. Um, in our, he's a psychologist, and uh, then they moved back to Colombia, and you know Colombia was a very violent place at the time, a lot of bad things going on there. So there's a big migration of Colombians out of Colombia to the United States and mm -hmm. South Florida, obviously being a close one. So that they came to South, South Florida in like the late '70s, early '80s, I want to say, and. Um, so, I'm trying to reconnect with that. Through that, um, I never lived in Miami, never lived in Colombia, um, never visited until I was in my 30s almost. Um, so, I had this kind of like, I had this connection with this culture, but it was very limited. It was only, the only time I experienced it was here in Miami. And so, I wanted to explore that idea of my Latin identity. I mean, I grew up in Pensacola, Florida. Um, we were a military family, moved around, and we finally settled in Pensacola, Florida. And it's very not Miami, not Latin, not South America. It's very Southern, you know. I always say my high school I went to was a decent sized high school. I don't know what the graduation class was, but I was probably uh, one out of three Latin kids in my in my whole class. Um, there wasn't very much diversity. Um, and, you know, we're, they call that area LA, Lower Alabama. So it's, it's pretty southern. Yeah. And, but I, I still felt identified with being Colombian or being Latin because people would ask me. That was a constant question, where are you from? Or where are your family from? And I would say, Colombia, oh, do you speak Spanish? No, I don't speak Spanish. And then they're like, you know, they're, the typical parents are drug dealers, this and that. Narcos, cooking yeah, cowboys. Exactly. It's like, okay. Yeah. I haven't I've heard that one before. But, <laughs> but anyway, so I always had this thought and this, this connection, and you know, um, it really sat with me. And so I was thinking, when I moved here, I was like, well, how can I, like, I'm, I'm very influenced by nature, like the nature around me and the environment around me, especially here. In South Florida, and then it, through travels to Colombia, I also felt that same connection through like, you know, South Florida has a feel to me because I've come here as a kid, and and also like feeling connected with the people, um, that was part of it, and then going to Colombia and also having this new experience, but also being very influenced by the environment, so making these little paintings of collaging these plants. And using photos that I would take on my trips to Colombia, and using photos I would take here in Miami, and through conversations, I kind of found that like I'm in a, in an essence, I'm, I'm making my own version of Colombia, or what I think of it, and it touches a lot of memory. So some of these paintings have to do with memory as a child, uh, things that identify as well. That I would say would be a, a, a Latin identifier, mm -hmm. I guess, I'm going to put that. But uh, I have a painting of me, my sister, and my father in front of my, the building my grandmother lives in. And she still lives in to this day, in Kendall. And this was very, very much what Columbia was to me. I traveled to this building, and we have family get-togethers there. Um, it's what I felt most, most identified with my Latin side. And then there's newer memories that I'm making. Um, so, such as this one here. Um, this is from one of my visits to Tayrona, which is near San Marta. And it's, you know, sometimes I have photos of these events, but like for this one, I didn't have a photo. So, it's, um, it's made up of, I mean, I guess a peek behind the scenes. It's uh, the background, the foliage is from the Fairchild Botanical Gardens. I find stuff um, through searching online or through magazines. I find imagery that I can piece together and make a composition or make 
a visual piece of this memory. Hmm. And sometimes I do have photos from the actual event and I just need to elaborate on it. So there's another piece over here where it's also from, from Santa Marta and it's of these people sitting on a beach. And, but I had, it was a very small photo. And so I had to create the canopy and create the shadows and those are all from here in Miami. So it's, it's kind of tying these two worlds together. It's a lot about memory. It's a lot about very similar too to my you know I almost think actually let's let's take the camera and let's show them okay. uh, some of these other images here absolutely okay so um, this piece in particular is the one um, where it was it's just a small photo it was about a cell phone photo about that size and um, oftentimes I want to elaborate on how it felt at the moment because we're you know we're talking about memory and so. Um, I have to find ways of creating the space that exists in my head, but doesn't necessarily exist as a photo. And usually that comes, 90% of the time it comes from other cell phone photos I took. So I take a lot of photos of plants and canopies and trees, even shadows. And, um, but I use those as a way to collage together, so it's almost like a drawing. and eventually paint that collaged photo, or that photo composite. And that's what you see over here. These are, um, these are like photo composites I make that are usually just printed out on, on regular copy paper, but I turned them into prints. So for example, this one belongs to a painting that's behind the wall over there. The photo collage for this painting here is on another wall over there. And so they kind of spread out. It's almost like little Easter eggs, if you can think of that <laughs> like that. Um, but it's a way to kind of show my process a little bit, but also, um, you know, kind of pine over, you know, doing these prints and, and involving my printmaking process is a way for me to pine over this image and why it's significant to me. So. Not all of them have prints that correlate with the paintings, but most of them do. This one can't help but uh, grasp our attention with our alligator friend in there. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here? Yeah, so um, this painting is a is also from Tirana near Santa Marta. That was, must have been a very significant day because <laughs> I have three paintings that are kind of coming out of the same location, same day. Um, so I had this photo that I was kind of enamored by the composition, which is this rock and the people on top of it. And in the photo, the original cell phone photo, I didn't capture the whole moment because off the side, we had crossed, it was the end of the day, we had crossed this little pathway that goes over this rock and then it crosses over like a little body of water. It wasn't this big, but there was a body of water here. And there was crocodiles. There's, in fact, in the photo you can see a crocodile poked his head poked right here. And all these people gathered to look at all these crocodiles because it, you know it's not typical that you see them that close to the people. And as this guy was crossing, he fell in, and I had taken the photo of the people. And in in the photo, you can see them kind of gasping or kind of looking over to see what happened. And so I just found it very interesting, and it. Um, it kind of sat with me, that story, you know, I told a story a few times. And so when I found the image, you know, going through my camera roll on my cell phone, I find that image and I'm like, wow, that's, that would be a really cool painting. How do I figure that out? So I've done this painting probably, I think, three times so far. And this has been, this has been the most successful one. And I'm exaggerating ideas of it. And, you know, I do collage in. So if you looked at the original photo, this is all collaged in, and then I had photos of the mountains uh, from the region that are also kind of collaged in. And the painting is really what ties us together, so it makes it look like it's one you know, scene. But, um, and then I had to add the crocodile just to, you know, originally I was like, I don't know, I'm gonna keep it. It was one of those things, like a, it was like a bookmark, kind of a placeholder there. And I was like, I could get rid of it, but then I feel it doesn't tell the story. And so I kept it, um, and it really just is it's that talking point of like, you have this very beautiful um, 
environment, but you also have this kind of danger that goes along with it, which is a, in a way is an idea of Colombia. You know, Colombia is this very beautiful place. Um, this place I haven't been to most of my life because it was dangerous, and um, now it's kind of come back a little bit, it's opened up a little bit. I've traveled there quite often, I've taken my son there. Um, and so it feels very safe, but there's always that looming danger of losing this this thing that I, I, I feel like I'm now just just now connecting with. And for the record, the person did not get eaten no, by No, no. He made it out. He had his family there, but it was kind of a scene, you know, like, because everybody thought, you know, as soon as he could touch that water, that gator's going to, or the crocodile was going to fly over there and, and grab him. Which obviously, the crocodile is probably just as scared as everybody else and doesn't want him to get near the whole thing. Right. But um, I also, a lot of the way I paint and, um, and the inspiration that I draw from is through other artists, such as like Peter Doig. I look a lot at Peter Doig. I look a lot at um, artists like Herman Anderson, Edvard Monk, um, and Fairford Porter is another one I look at. And these are pages that I'm, they may have similar ideas. Um, but it's really based on the way in which they paint, uh, the freedom kind of which they paint. If you've ever seen a Peter Doig painting, and in fact, a lot of people are like, oh, do you look at Doig? I'm like, yeah, I do look at Doig. Hmm. Um, I just enjoy the kind of, the way he goes about his paintings and, and the kind of not having to fully render out something to get a point across or an idea across. And so really, this. This painting was kind of one of those that was very inspired by Peter Doig. And not all of them are that inspired by some of Peter Doig's paintings, but I do take the things I did in here into other paintings. Interesting. I'm, I'm glad that you shared that. I'm glad that you made that correlation there. And I'm glad that that inspiration has proven to be beneficial in your work. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so amazing to see this body of work. Um, for those that would be interested in purchasing work, commissioning work, or engaging with you, taking a class, um, well, first, what's your, the best way for them to get in touch with you? Social media, email, so, website? Um, the best way to get in touch with me is through either social media or um, email, which you can find on my website. It's Matt, the number four, H-A-N-D dot com. Pretty, pretty simple. Um, and then my Instagram is also matt.the4hand. And uh, I would just send, yeah, send me a message if you're, if you're interested in the work. I do, I mean, obviously I do commissions. I do other little side gigs to kind of keep this whole thing going. Um, but I mean, if you wanted to, if you're interested in my work, you know, I have a price list. I could send you a price list. I could also um, we can negotiate something, or um, or even if you want an original piece, you know, there's always room for that. Or what if somebody would like to commission you to make a print? To make a print? Um, now that's a little different because with a print you're getting multiples, so, mm -hmm. and there's also like an original plate and stuff like that. So there's there's things that go into that. I definitely would. Uh, explore the option, but um, it's just something that um, if you wanted to commission me to do a run of prints, if it's original, you know, there's a certain cost. If it's something that, say, you did a, um, a print but you need to get it printed, then that's a separate cost. It's mm -hmm. an hourly cost, and unless it's like a really big thing, then I usually do like one month fee. So and classes are available at, at Oolite? Classes are available at Oolite. Um, we teach, I primarily just teach printmaking classes, but we also have, um, we have little workshops. Uh, I do try, I'm, I'm working currently on teaching a landscape painting class out of Oolite, so if you're interested in that, keep your eye out on the website. You can register on the website. Um, Oolite's pretty, like, their website's pretty straightforward. I think you just couple, Clicks a button, you pay for the class, and then you're registered. 
but yeah. That's Anything else coming up that they should look out for? We have a, uh, so this is going to be open until May 14th. So if you want to come check out the exhibition, you have until May 14th. And then there'll be another group of artists coming in. Um, if uh, we do have the exhibition coming up for the resident artists, the Ulay resident artists, and that is May 14th, or not May 14th, that is April 19th, I think from like 6 to 9 o'clock. And um, that will be all the residents, our, our current residents at Ulay Arts. This is a group show. It'll be a good time to see some really great talent. We really appreciate it. So much talent, so much beautiful work. We'll just give you a little taste here uh, of the ongoing exhibition um, here at the Hollywood Art and Culture Center, right here in downtown Hollywood on the circle. Um, really great show curated um, by Megan Kent and uh, in collaboration with Ulight Arts. You get a chance to see Matt's work firsthand. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to Matt. If you have any questions about Broward and 954, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're an open book. And maybe we'll get Matt to choose 954 uh, Actually, maybe. We'll one see. day in the future. We'll <laughs> see. Thanks for doing this, Matt. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. Cheers.